Well, I'd like to thank uh, Chris and the uh, Stanford Archaeology Centre for their great generosity, not only in inviting me here, but for making it possible for me to come. Um, I feel, uh, when I was invited, I, I felt, and I still did feel up until the last paper, somewhat of an imposter, because uh, I am a prehistoric archaeologist, and, um, and I haven't had a lot to do with uh, historical archaeology over the years. However, I was delighted to see that uh, Ned Alpers is, is uh, clearly enthusiastic about uh, the prehistoric archaeology, and so I feel uh, a bit more relieved. Um, <clears throat> I should apologise also for <laughs> many of these slides. I'm not a very uh, uh, technically proficient person in doing these things, and uh, you might need your sunglasses because some of them are a bit garish. Um, our project uh, crossing the Green Sea originated in the observation that um, the histories of pre-European island settlement in the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean appeared vastly different. In the Pacific Ocean, uh, long distance sailing began about 3,000 years ago. It immediately crossed the 400 kilometre wide sailing barrier that had existed for nearly 40,000 years at the eastern end of the Solomon Islands. And it proceeded to expand out for another 13,000 kilometres eastward to uh, New Zealand, Easter Island and Hawaii. In contrast, long distance sailing, <coughs> albeit uh, primarily coastal, began around about 5,000 years ago in the Arabian Sea and um, <coughs> never expanded beyond 400 kilometres from continental shores up until the time of European settlement. So you end up with rather different patterns in the settlement of the uh, remote or oceanic islands. Most of the islands are found in Polynesia, only the ones around the periphery are missed. In the Indian Ocean, most of the islands are not found or at least not settled at all. The pattern in um, uh, the Central Atlantic is somewhat like the Indian Ocean and the pattern in the North Atlantic is somewhat more like the South Pacific, uh, a, a point perhaps reinforced by the fact that on Madeira, the evidence of, hu uh, of uh, human contact is restricted to discoveries of the bones of the house mouse. And when they did the DNA on, it, on them, they found that they came from Scandinavia. So uh, <coughs> not local at all. Um, but to the extent that uh, uh, colonisation was very different, or rather the, the, the fact that colonisation was very different does not translate in so much into the... Which, which do I press to get the next one? Um, Down? Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Into the uh, chronologies. And you can see that there's quite an interesting uh, similarity in the chronologies of um, island colonisation between the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. In the Pacific Ocean, we customarily explain this as being the result of occasional uh, innovations in maritime technology, notably the introduction of the sail at around about 4,000 years ago or more, and later um, the uh, development of the double canoe. Whether that kind of argument uh, would also apply in terms of um, climatic change and, uh, uh, and maritime technology would apply in the Indian Ocean is a matter which, of course, still needs to be uh, investigated. Today I want to comment briefly on salient dimensions of maritime mobility, which I take as the kind of generic term uh, within which sits the interests in connectivity, which are uh, the primary topic of this, uh, this session. And uh, to, in some respects I take a Pacific Ocean perspective, which is a a kind of an implicit argument that uh, connectivity is not just about connecting continents, it's also about connecting oceans. And that the, um, that the Pacific Ocean may have as much relevance in thinking about the Indian Ocean as indeed the Atlantic Ocean, certainly in the historical period, may have in terms of the Indian Ocean. Uh, I shall focus on pre-European colonisation of the southern tropical islands these being the ones below the line, below the equator. The islands above it, as you could see from the previous slide, were uh, all occupied around about 2,000 years ago or longer. The ones below it, uh, most of them not occupied, and those that were possibly younger, and we'll come to that matter in a minute. 
And um, that was the specific area of our research in the Crossing the Green Seas project. And I'm going to comment on the geographical pattern and chronology of colonisation, picking up uh, some points made by Ned, the maritime climate and uh, shipping in relation to migration from Southeast Asia, and the origins of the Madagascan colonisation. Our research on the main Seychelles Islands, the Cocos Keeling Islands and Christmas Island, has disclosed no sign of pre-European human occupation. And uh, work by, uh, and we can see um, some evidence of this in pollen core from Mahi and Seychelles, and you can see that while there's a small trace of charcoal <coughs> going deep, the beginning of the charcoal rise, which is usually a sign of the arrival of people, begins at around, around the time of human <coughs> occupation. And from then on, you're starting to get <coughs> some substantial changes in the vegetation. Um, Krish uh, Sitar did some work in this project, as it happens, on uh, Mauritius. And uh, came to the similar conclusion that there was no sign of any uh, pre-European occupation in Mauritius. And that view has uh, subsequently again been reinforced by uh, pollen analyses. This is a recent piece of work which again shows that the charcoal particle count is way up near the top there. There's practically no um, charcoal in the sequence below that. However, when we went to the Chagos Islands working on uh, Diego Garcia, we did find that uh, there was a certain amount of charcoal coming in at about this point here, around about AD 1300. And uh, we think that there was at least some kind of contact, some visit, but we could never find, we dug and we cored and we did everything we could, but we could not find any archaeological evidence of any kind to suggest that um, Diego Garcia had ever been colonised. Genetic analyses of the bones of commensal animals, which uh, we collected on various of these islands, especially of rats, um, has also failed to disclose any evidence of pre-European colonisation. So our work on those islands has effectively confirmed the existing non-colonisation of um, those particular islands. My conjectural <coughs> explanation for this is geographic and, and uh, also inconclusive. Most of the southern tropical islands lie within the southeast trade wind belt, south of the main trading routes and effectively inaccessible from the northern sector of the Indian Ocean to sailing vessels lacking a, a substantial windward capacity in fresh to strong weather, so that's say 20 to 30 knots, which is a fairly good um, estimate of state of trade wind wind speed. Uh, no pre-European vessels were renowned for that kind of capacity. However, islands that lie near the equator in the western part uh, of the ocean, notably the Seychelles, were open to contact from East Africa and South Asia through frequent westerly and northerly winds, especially during the winter season, and they were relatively close to known sailing routes. Um, <clears throat> as the islands, or the, the major islands in the Seychelles, are, are high and, and granitic, <coughs> it does seem rather improbable that, uh, despite our results, that nobody reached these, um, these islands before um, AD 1500 or so. Most of the islands in the Indian Ocean, however, are coralline, and um, they could have been occupied at times prior to the, at uh, times during the late Holocene, with the evidence then being wiped out by rising sea levels. So you can see there are places there where the, the curve dips below the <clears throat> line of current sea level. And um, those are times when you might expect, <coughs> excuse me, when people were traveling around, that they uh, found some of these coral, coral islands and colonized them for a while. And then that evidence, when the sea level rose, it's just simply the waves just simply wiped out the evidence. So <clears throat> I have to say that some uncertainties remain in our conclusions, and I'll canvas uh, another of these later. The islands that were colonised, the Comoros and Madagascar, were readily accessible by short passages from East Africa in, in westerly weather. However, the timing of colonisation uh, is widely debated with propositions varying from 2000 BC up to AD 1000, as was mentioned earlier on. On archaeological grounds, 
the consensus is that the Camorras in Madagascar were colonised in the period AD 500 to 800, although both radiocarbon dates, um, the types of pottery and um, uh, the introduction of exotic uh, beads and so on, um, the ages on those tend to cluster towards the later end of that, that span. A startling <coughs> challenge, as we've already heard, was issued to this uh, proposition last year <coughs> in a paper by Bob Joe Henry Wright, Chantal Redamalahi and some others, in which they argued that at the site of Lakatoni Anger at the northern tip of, of uh, Madagascar, the optically stimulated luminescence dating suggested that people had arrived 2400 BC. Um, on the other hand, their dating, radiocarbon dating of charcoal, showed that the sequence varied from around about 8400 to 8100. Um, I, I could go into this a bit more later on if anybody wanted to hear it, but uh, my view of this is that basically the two techniques are probably accurate and the results are probably more or less correct. It's just that they're dating different things. OSL dating is dating the age of the sediments, the sand, the quartz sand that was laid down in the site at any time for millennia back. OSL uh, radiocarbon dating is dating the introduced burnt plants, the charcoal that is introduced by people. So um, I don't uh, accept the conclusion that was drawn <coughs> in that paper. Of course, the main argument for earlier occupation of Madagascar has been apparent evidence of butchery on remains of the extinct megafauna dated up to 2000 BC. The extinct megafauna and um, another kind of primate there as well um, consisted of these very large lemurs, um, the elephant birds, Epiornis and Munoronis, um, <coughs> the dwarf uh, Madagascan uh, hippo, the uh, Nile crocodile and, and some other taxa as well, a large predator, etc. It's on this basis of cut marks on the bones of these animals that it's been argued that uh, the settlement of Madagascar might go all the way back to about 2,000 years ago, in other words, roughly contemporaneous with the OSL dates from um, Lakatoni Anjo. Well, we've looked at most of the bones that have been involved in this argument. We haven't looked at Anjohebi, although I've seen the pictures of it and I'm not in the least convinced. And um, I don't want to go into this in great detail because uh, it's a rather esoteric topic and there, there would be a lot to say, but let us just look at one example. This is the example that is most often quoted as, as evidence of cut marks on the bones of the extinct megafauna of Madagascar. On the right there, uh, an image from a paper by Perez arguing that these marks here are cut marks. We looked at this very closely and we don't see that they are cut marks. Now the first thing is to note <coughs> that the orientation of the marks shifts from more or less transverse across that curved process of the bone, the radius, and gradually becomes um, angled more along the line of the curve of that process as you go towards the distal end of the bone. That's an effect that would be most easily produced. I mean, it could be produced by cut marks if you, for some reason, you were cutting more increasingly on an angle as you went towards the end of the bone. But that effect could be produced equally by trampling on the bone in the presence of some agents, such as pieces of quartz rock and so on, which are very common in this site, by the way, in Talon Bibby. We excavated here, and, and um, it's just full of, of lumps up to about a metre wide and down to sort of pebble size of quartz rock and there's also quartz sand, coarse quartz sand. So if a hippopotamus came along and stood on this bone and in doing so rotated it in the sand, you would end up with, uh, in, in a single event, you would end up with that different orientation. <clears throat> and then when you look at the actual characteristics of the damage that's uh, on, on the surface of this bone, in a sample on the right hand side there, and you compare it with the criteria which are used to distinguish cut marks from trampling marks um, by um, people who are specialists in this kind of thing, you can see very clearly that our sample conforms quite precisely with the evidence of trampling and not at all with the evidence of cut marks. 
Other damaged bones um, have certainly been modified culturally, and you can see examples of these in the literature. But the problem is the damage is not butchery, and when or how it occurred is very uncertain. We suspect that much of it uh, reflects the manner in which bones were dug up 100 years ago or earlier, because nearly all of these examples of cut mark bones come from museum collections. Um, uh, and they were collected between about 1880 and, and um, 1910. We don't know the manner in which they were collected, but we can assume that they were collected by digging up with picks and shovels and that sort of thing. And the, bone, the damage that's on the bones certainly looks like that. At any rate, in order to investigate this matter further, we excavated um, three important sites in the southwest which have produced damaged megafaunal bone dated to 2,000 years ago or more, Eton Pulu, and Bolisatra and Talambibi. We found that nearly all the bones of extinct fauna did show some damage. But the damage in all cases um, is very light. It's extensive, but it's light. And only in a few cases do you get some examples here that look <coughs> potentially as if they might have been cut marks. But you can also see there's a huge number of striae in between those um, major marks. And they're very shallow and very broad. And that, again, that's very typical of trampling. They, you can confuse them with cut marks, but they are not cut marks. On the other hand, the bones of extant lemur species, like the Sephaka lemur, we do get very clear examples of what um, all archaeologists would regard as typical cut marks. Another source of argument for early occupation of Madagascar has been paleontological data of vegetation change generally um, associated with burning and dated up to about 2,000 years ago in the southwest. But of course the southwest is the driest area in uh, Madagascar and it wouldn't be unexpected that had there been natural burning it would occur there at those times. This little implement here I suppose is to point with, is it? Look at that. Um, a recent paper has uh, argued that the main area, the main point, or, or rather a period of transition in vegetation and the main burning events are here at around about 1000 AD, give or take 200 years, when you have five of the seven regions, these are all the regions of Madagascar across here, um, have major vegetation transitions and three of them also have major fire peaks. There is one of these fire peaks down around 2000 just here, but as I say, it's in the southwest region. The authors of this paper assumed that people had arrived <coughs> 300 BC, but one could argue equally, I think, that if you take that assumption away, then the actual evidence would suggest that it's around about this point. Um, <coughs> and you can see in our, our work on uh, Talon Bibby, shows how the various um, sources of evidence can be associated together in one site. We excavated, um, particularly in the upper levels of the site, the, the lower levels are of um, late Quaternary Age, they go way back thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. <clears throat> so we confined ourselves to the, to the stratigraphy which was likely to be <coughs> before and within the, the period of human settlement. And, <clears throat> and what we found was, first of all, we dated the a lot of the bones from the museum collections that had the cut marks, and sure enough, they are, they're all pretty old. Um, we also found bones from extinct tax ourselves in our, in our site, none of them with, uh, with butchery marks. <clears throat> and we found a series of uh, lots of bones from living taxa, in many cases with butchery marks. <clears throat> and you can see that what we've got here is something like this, that there are quite a large number of taxa, even in our small excavation of the extinct fauna of Madagascar, that are surviving up to the time of human arrival. And not much later, if indeed later at all, people are coming along and they're killing the, um, what is now the extant or living taxa, particularly the uh, small lemurs, and they're also leaving charcoal behind, and these give you dates consistent with that. So <clears throat> somewhere around about 850, we might expect um, people had arrived on this site. The site was littered with the bones of um, extinct fauna because this is the shore of a, of a former lake. And um, when we did the 
took samples all the way through the stratigraphy and counted the charcoal, we can see that the charcoal rise also begins at about this point. So on one site there, we can see quite a good argument <coughs> for the proposition that people had arrived <coughs> in around about the 9th century. If you look at the um, distribution by age of um, radiocarbon dated bones of the extinct taxa of Madagascar, you can see that where you have relatively large samples, as in the south coastal region, which is that central, central set of um, columns, that nearly all the taxa survive up until the known uh, period of human settlement, 80, 40, uh, 950 to 1450, and possibly, and a number of them into the period of possible human settlement, 950 to, to 650. Well, we would say there was actual settlement partly in that period. So um, the argument now is uh, that um, megafaunal extinction was largely after human arrival. It, was, it may have been a process that reflected prolonged drought, as was argued in that, uh, I didn't mention this, I'm sorry to say, in the, the uh, paper that looked at the regional distribution of uh, vegetation change. That big band from 800 to 1200 corresponded with a period of prolonged drought. So prolonged drought might have been involved. Um, deforestation might have been involved and, and a number of other causes as well. But we, <coughs> we think that it's possible that there was um, also just a modest rate in, in a modest increase in the rate of predation may have caused extinction because the, the lemurs in particular um, had uh, low birth rates, they had um, prolonged a period of nurturing of the young, and so they've got a small number of a small number of offspring which they're looking after over a long period of time, and they're long lived. Now, animals like that that have those kinds of conservative life histories, you only require a small amount of extra mortality to drive them into extinction. It would only take for most of these animals um, the occasional extraction of one individual by hunting groups living in and around the area in which they're living. Um, to gradually drive them into extinction in a process which has been called um, by a colleague whose name I've just escaped me for the moment, imperceptible overkill. That is, you can't see it because when an individual animal is killed and butchered somewhere out in the bush, nothing much comes back to the site. And we don't get those um, so, uh, butchery sites which we're also, also familiar with in places like North America with bison kill sites or New Zealand with moa kill sites. And, and, um, and many in the, in the Pleistocene of Europe as well. They just don't occur. So in the matter of timing, it is our contention that the initial colonization of Madagascar was at the late end, oh dear, <coughs> uh, of the various archeological propositions, possibly as late as about 8700 to 800. Well, where did these people come from and how? The types of offshore vessels that existed in Southeast Asia at the time at which people might have crossed from Southeast Asia to Madagascar are <coughs> not well known. <coughs> They're well known in some other areas, but not in Southeast Asia. And there are some problems, I think, in the use of the replica vessels that um, has gone on in trying to demonstrate this thing about transoceanic movement. The Borobudur ship, for example, was built with a plank displacement hull in this rep They made a replica of it and sailed it across the ocean about. Uh, 50 odd days, and you can see she's got a <coughs> very nice fared hull. But um, Sean McGrail, who was a, a well known um, um, maritime archaeologist, points out that if you look carefully at the picture of the Borobudur, she has near the waterline or at the waterline a series of interlinked uh, beams going crossways and a long ways, and he says this is a raft. So if it's a raft, it's not going to sail at anything like the kind of capability as the replica uh, of her. The Saramanuk um, is, I think, a better bet, but both the Borobudur and the Saramanuk were unable to cross the ocean without stopping once, uh, Saramanuk in the Cocos Islands, Borobudur in Chagos, and both of them had terrible problems with their outriggers. And in fact, had they not stopped, they probably wouldn't have made it because they had to replace and repair them. And um, that's very familiar, by the way, with the situation of the 
distribution of outriggers versus other kinds of vessels in the Pacific, but I won't go there for the moment. Furthermore, there's no evidence that craft of, the kind, of these kinds here, which are uh, to some extent validated by evidence in Southeast Asia, that these existed in East Africa or in Madagascar at the time in question. And in fact, probably the only vessel that did was something like this, the well-known split-rigged <coughs> single outrigger canoe. And uh, don't try and read all that, but um, an expert on the sea-keeping qualities of canoes did a little exercise for me to determine uh, what, was, what would be the probability if you built a big one of these 37 foot of getting from one side of the ocean to the other and came to the conclusion that you wouldn't get more than about 60% of the length of the passage. So when you look at um, work on uh, simulation of voyaging, trying to determine you know, whether people could reach from one side of the ocean to the other, you have to take into account that a lot of the factors that are involved in it are, are really purely guesswork. And most particularly, as we've found in the Pacific, they ignore the real problems of climatic variation. For example, <coughs> they don't take into account, except in the sense of averaging the data, the huge variation that occurs with movements of the um, Indian Ocean Dipole, which is a regional weather system which, like, like ENSO, like El Nino, moves from one side of the ocean to the other at a, not a regular interval, it's an actually irregular interval, but fairly frequently, left to right, west to east. We have the Indian Ocean Dipole in the Indian Ocean and it's you know, teleconnected to ENSO. It's doing this and it's hugely changing wind directions, wind speeds, weather systems and everything else. They don't include that. Um, they don't look at the kinds of changes that occur with the movement of the, um, uh, the Indian Ocean uh, convection zone, the intertropical convection zone, which moves up and down through the year, and the effect that that also has on wind directions. For example, look at the top there, winter half the year, which might be probably the time when people would um, try to get across the ocean because in theory, it's southeasterly. Well, you can see, yes, strong southeasterly winds. But if you came out of the Strait of, oh, I've got this, haven't I? If you came out of the um, Java Strait, here, what are you facing? About a thousand kilometres of westerly winds. Um, I've been work this is projects in my mind, this idea is in my mind because I've been working on a project in the Pacific which is looking at precisely this problem. Now the advantage in the Pacific is that we have such good records of ENSO and the, and the other um, major factors in climatic change that it's possible now to work out at a decadal level, that's to say every 10 years, where the, where the winds are blowing and how they're changing. And what we see is that, and this is just one example, for New Zealand here, that there was a route where the wind is blowing down, as you can see there, from Central East Polynesia, Tahiti and so on, down to New Zealand between AD 1220 and 1280. At AD 1300, it's all changed and the wind is blowing away from New Zealand and towards the east and it remains closed for about 400 years. So that's the kind of data that we have to have in order to really understand anything about, um, uh, anything about sailing conditions in the Indian Ocean let alone about uh, the types of sailing vessels. Turning <coughs> now to um, Madagascan origins, the prevailing hypothesis is that Madagascar particularly, and probably also the Comoros, were settled initially by people who came directly across the ocean from Indonesia. The arguments for a connection of some kind from historical linguistics, material, culture, Social customs <clears throat> and so on are well known and, and broadly unimpeachable, um, I might say. But the genetics in particular also suggests that the migrants who reached Madagascar had already acquired some African admixture. One study suggested 10% of African admixture in the uh, population, amongst in the, in the female population. Another study, 40 to 50% African admixture in both um, sexes. Either way, the suggestion is that the migration beginning no earlier than 
the 7th or 8th century AD, went through East Africa, an hypothesis which Adelaar, the, the linguist, calls the African anteroom scenario. And certainly much of the early pottery of Madagascar is uh, African rather than Southeast Asian in style, and work on the early burials in the Camorras <coughs> also suggests that those people were of African origin. If the colonising population was already of uh, multiple descent, oh, I missed a slide here, I'll just uh, go past it because we probably don't need it. It just shows that the Indian Ocean Dipole and the Indian Ocean Dipole, like ENSO, creates vastly different periods of drought and humidity. Get past that. Um, my guess is that uh, Indian, uh, Indonesian migration moved along the established sailing routes through South Asia. Both the linguistics and the, and the genetics point to an origin in Borneo and imply a rather coherent group in a deliberate migration. As oceanic sailing is unlikely to have uh, been practiced from Borneo and as the Malagasy terminology of sailing vessels and navigation was largely acquired from Malay, is that for me? No. <laughs> the impression is of a population with little offshore competence. If so, it would make sense to take passage in a, in a trading vessel. It would also make sense that movement to the Camorras in Madagascar began at the time of the early development of East African trading networks and within that framework. Turning uh, lastly <coughs> to some broader observations which might have implications for historical archaeology. First, the current evidence is now more strongly in support of late and limited colonisation of the remote Indian Ocean islands than it has been hitherto. The absence of pre-European colonisation on most of the remote islands, high or low, suggests that they were not reached from any of the continental margins before AD 1500. Perhaps this reinforces the argument that maritime mobility uh, was yoked to coastal trade by cost constraints on smaller vessels until the advent of Chinese and Portuguese shipping. I don't know, but I suggest it. Or did the scarcity of colonisation of the remote islands perhaps reflect the absence of uh, te necessary technology, technology that was necessary to expand further, particularly southward into the Indian Ocean? For example, the Latin sail, which may not have arrived until the 16th century. I know there's argument about this. Um, or the arrival of European hull shapes, which made um, vessels both um, uh, faster and uh, more weatherly. Secondly, I think climate history of the oceans at high res resolutions is utterly critical to examining hypotheses about where, when, and why sailing routes were used in the pre-European era. I think I've made that plain. But changes in sailing conditions were no less important after AD 1500. It might turn out to be quite significant for understanding the, the history of seafaring in the European era. <coughs> in any case, such evidence, decadal scale or even higher resolution if we can get it, adds a much needed dose of historical realism to the discussion of, of maritime mobility. Um, arguments for and against direct transoceanic migration in relation to the Comoros and Madagascar bear importantly and generally on the objectives um, uh, of maritime mobility in the Indian Ocean as a whole. Do we have a mercantile story referring to the development of trading and other um, connections around the continental coast and a colonisation story that refers to independent settlement of the Oceanic Islands? Or is there only a mercantile story that embraces island colonisation? Or are there some other kinds of accounts of pre-European mobility? Fourth, <clears throat> fourthly, I've tried to avoid discussing this topic in terms of Austronesian versus other cultural groupings because it involves an implicit assumption that being Austronesian uh, includes an, an innate predisposition towards um, long-distance seafaring. An idea, uh, by the way, that was prevalent for many years, and certainly when I was a boy, about the British. We had to learn various poems and songs which <laughs> celebrated the innate ability of the British to rule the waves. It is logically absurd, and in the Austronesian case, it is contradicted by evidence that only a tiny fraction of the genetic variety encompassed by the Austronesian language family ever travelled far across the oceans. Yet it remains fundamental to archaeological discourse 
um, in the Indian and the Pacific Oceans. And, and to some extent, I think uh, you see that kind of cultural reification in some accounts of, the, of Arab seafaring in the Indian Ocean as well. And lastly, I would like to encourage the idea of comparative research both between prehistoric and historical uh, archaeology, which is really what uh, this workshop and others are about, but also across the ocean basins. There was a commonality of environmental changes. There was a great deal of cross-fertilisation in maritime technology, which went certainly between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And um, uh, looking on that wider time frame, I think, would be beneficial to our studies. Thank you.